Hello, and welcome to our second talk in the Race Inequality and Language in Education speaker series here at Stanford's Graduate School of Education. My name is Coco Massingale, and I'm a doctoral student in the Ryle program. And before we begin, I have a few logistical notes. Closed captioning is available through the Zoom navigation bar, and we will also have a Q&A starting at 345. So please pay, place any questions that you have using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Don't put them in the chat. I'll probably miss them, but if you use Q&A, I will catch them. Uh, and a recording of this talk will also be available via our website, and we'll put the link to that in the chat at the end. So with that out of the way, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who also happens to be our Ryle program chair. Uh, Dr. Brian A. Brown is a professor of science education and former associate dean at Stanford University. His research examines the role of language in science teaching and learning. Dr. Brown studies how race, technology, language, and culture impact science teaching in urban schools. Dr. Brown's research examines how urban science education has underserved minority students by its failure to design instruction that is sensitive to the language and cultural needs of urban populations. His early research projects lead, led to the development of an instructional approach known as disaggregate teaching that is designed to improve learning for underserved populations. He continued that research by examining how the language, how the language and similarities, or as he says, conceptual continuities between students in formal language and those valued by science have great potential for improved learning. Currently, Dr. Brown's research explores how innovative technology can be used as a mediator to engage in effective, culturally responsive science teaching. Dr. Brown leads the Science in the City Research Group, a collective of postdoctoral fellows and graduate students who collectively explore how technology can serve as a mediator between a monolingual and mo monocultural teaching force and the multilingual and multicultural student population. His 2020 book, Science in the City, was the winner of the 2020 Book of the Year from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. I can also say from both a personal experience and by virtue of his reputation here that Dr. Brown is a phenomenal teacher and a brilliant scholar. And I'm so excited to join y'all in learning from him today. So Dr. Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you, Coco. I really appreciate that introduction. And thank you for everyone who uh, is joining us today. Uh, this is not the venue that I would want to, to meet and greet you in. I, I wish we could do this differently, but this is the sign of the times. And so I want to start by saying uh, I wrote a book that captured about 10 to 12 years of, um, of uh, my work. And I, that book was released one month before the, the start of this global pandemic. And as a result, um, I hadn't been able to share this work with the community. And I look forward to doing that today. And so the title of the talk is The Meaning Beyond Words how language, race, and culture impact science, teaching, and learning. But before I start, I am privileged to work with the most incredible uh, group of graduate students and postdocs at Science in the City Lab that includes Catherine Rebuy, Matt Wilsey, uh, Kendra Shabalmahim, Danny Pimentel, Emily Ray, uh, Tamara Shabalmahim, uh, Brandy Cannon, and uh, Faye Marie Vassal. I, I'm just absolutely privileged to work with them and this work reflects their efforts. So, so let me start by saying, uh, I was frustrated, I wrote a book you know, capturing years and years of work and I couldn't share it with anyone. I was at home doing this presentation in my in my house and uh, I thought I would be able to do it with you in person, but uh, here we go again. This will probably be my last time sharing it. So I look forward to, to the conversation. So there has been a revolution in education and I want us to really think about it uh, in, in the world broadly. Uh, this thing on, on, on one side of the screen is a phone, but this thing on the other side of the thing is also called a phone. Now I want to Note that there's a quiet revolution that happened. Here's what I mean. Uh, I was told, if, if unless the information is absolutely pertinent, you can text me the primary set of information. Don't call me. So although we have a, a phone, we, we don't even use it the same way. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember, the, the smartphone is more powerful than the college computer that I have. And so some ways, there has been a subtle revolution in our technology. Similarly, there was a time when it would seem absolutely ridiculous to jump in a stranger's car and ask for a ride someplace else. But with the invention and development of Uber and Lyft, we saw a subtle transition and a subtle revolution in the way that we got around, right? I want to argue that classrooms have not experienced a kind of revolutionary shift that we would like to see. And so this picture that is black and white is only different 
Then the other picture, because of color, you notice the students are sitting in the same roles, that the teacher is the sage on stage. So the question is, have we have revolutionized learning in the way that the technology and culture has shifted? All right, I'm gonna leave that as a question because it really was the thing that drove me to think about how are we engaging in high quality instruction for those who need it the most, right? So I wanna argue that um, for those of you who don't know, this thing on uh, that is red, you'd have to spin it, you punch in the numbers. There's something amazing, that is a phone. And, uh, and the other thing on the right is also a phone. But I, I wanted to, to share with you something that is really fascinating to me, is there was a time when I remembered everybody's phone number. If you ask me what, what is you know what is Sean's phone number, I could say it's, it's 777-9311. I remembered everybody's phone number. So there's something powerful that happened to all of us. The minute, that we did not need that information, that I could scroll it in the smartphone, we fundamentally deleted all that information. I wanna argue that also happened in another context. Uh, we used to be able to get turn by turn directions. You're gonna exit, exit 43, you're gonna go down two streets where you'll see a shell station, make a right at the shell, two doors on the left, you'll see a red house, make a left at the red house and that's where, that's where we live, right? The minute that we could scroll uh, and use our phones as GPS devices, instead of having to purchase those large things that went on the windows is that we, found the information less important. So here's what I wanna argue. Uh, if we no longer need information, these incredible computers on our shoulders delete all unused and unneeded information, then what are we supposed to do in schools? If the information being taught does not provide meaningful context for discussion and use, uh, we can use these examples to recognize we're probably not gonna remember that information, right? And so I also noticed something else in our uh, teach red courses. We offer a simple exercise. We have people explain big ideas in the most efficient forms possible. And then we, we found out something. We do these things called 20-second stories. Just tell me the big idea of some concept put it in, in, and put it on a YouTube video. One of those videos has over 140,000 views, which suggests something, that when young people are looking for information, they want a, a, an idea, they're going to YouTube to get content. Right? And not only are they going to YouTube to get content, they're looking for the most efficient way to do it. Give me something efficient, give me something fast so I can understand as quickly as possible because young people are smart. Now here's the thing, why are we asking young people to explain in the same ways that we've done before if we notice that a subtle revolution has already happened? We have more knowledge in the palm of our hand than we've ever had before, but we're teaching in the ways that we have taught for, for centuries. And so, the world has changed. Science is serving a, a much more vital role in making sense of the world. The, the last two years, I cannot tell you the numbers of times I've had conversations about production of antibodies or the role of viruses is that bioengineering is now a central role in, in everyday discussion. So the question I have for you, and this is what I want to center first, is what are young people thinking about their future in science? Do they see it as a place where they have access to being the people who have the power and knowledge to impact the world by understanding science at a deep level and becoming scientific leaders. And so I wanna start with this image. Uh, years ago, as I started to think about a book, this was the motivation. I saw this picture, I would in person ask you who this was, but because of our, our format, uh, this is James Meredith, approximately 1965. He is registering for class at the University of Mississippi. Now I want, I want you to think about this. He's not in class, he's registering for class at the University of Mississippi. Now to his right and left are National Guardsmen. Their job is to, to keep him safe. Now I just want you to take a look at the picture. What is powerful and striking about this picture to me is that nobody is happy here. The people charged with supporting him, keeping him safe, they look miserable. The other people who are there to protest his very existence are also upset. Now here's the challenge for me. James Meredith had to go to class he had to perform well. So I started thinking about a random Tuesday in week three. What is James Meredith's academic experience like when he is representing all people, when he is sitting in his classroom, he offers an idea, when he knows that his idea will be judged differently? There's a colloquial phrase in, in the African-American community to talk about this. It's called the black text. And the idea is this. You've heard it before. In order to be seen as equal, we got to be twice as good because what's inherent is that racism and injustice are an inherent part of community. And what he needed to do was be extraordinary in that context. Now, what's amazing to me about that image is not only did James Meredith go to class and graduate, but he got a PhD. He got shot on the way in that process. It wasn't an a, a, a easy pathway, but he was able to succeed 
in a way that was fundamentally uh, impossible and powerful. It is what is called the Black text. So here's the question. What is a modern form of the Black text, the additional linguistic burden that young people are having to face? And I want to argue today that one linguistic ba battle or linguistic Black text is how we view language, right? Imagine if you can, what does an intelligent person sound like? Do, that, do this exercise in your head. Do they have a thick Southern accent? Do they sound like a person from Compton, right? Do they sound like a member of a particular community who might prefer to say buck instead of cup, right? The question is, the way that we communicate, how is it connected to how people perceive us? There's a general bias that continues to exist around language. Now, John Ball did work about variation. It's really powerful work to suggest when we communicate a message, we're always communicating two things. Number one is content, and the other part is who I am. So if I say, what's up? If I say, what's good, shouty? If I say, how are you? All of those are greetings, but each of those can mark you as a particular part, particular type of person, and we have the power to choose how we want to communicate. Quick example, me being from Oakland, California, if you say hella, you're one of my people, right? I, I recognize that in, in, as people mark themselves by their localized language, it enables you to sound like grandma and there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the question. What is the additional price that young people pay for not sounding like the imagined young people that teachers expect them to sound like? So let me give you a quick example. This is uh, taken from a national championship football game, probably about 2015, 2013. Uh, this young man, Jameis Winston, he throws a, uh, a, he throws a touchdown pass. Everyone is excited, and they interview him about this championship, and here's what he said. 15 to go in this game. Final drive. What did you tell your teammates around you? I said, guys, we didn't come here for no reason. I said, guys, this is ours, man. This is our, all the adversity we went through. The first few quarters, it was ours to take. And like I was just saying, we control our own destiny. And those men looked me in my eye and they said, we got this, Jameis. And I said, we said, are you, I said, are you strong? They said, I'm strong if you strong. And I said, we strong, man. After struggling through the first half, what was the biggest adjustment you guys made at halftime? We had to go back to playing Florida State football. We came out here, we, wasn't, we, were, we were letting us be bigger than the game. We were bigger than the game. Then we had to say, hey, let's play full state football because can't nobody be bigger than this game. And we did that. And we came out victorious. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Me minutes later. Minutes later. Um, and I got a chance to use Twitter for research purposes. I was super happy about that. But Dee Dee McCarron, who in context is important here, who is the mother of A.J. McCarron, the quarterback of the University of Alabama, she says, am I listening to English? That response, um, moments later, she said this, and I, I can't derive what happened, but here's a second tweet that same evening. It says, anyone that knows our family knows that we're far from racist. My tweet was not in any way meant that way. I sincerely apologize if I offended anyone. So in some ways it's clear, uh, Dee McCarran got some feedback. Now that is interesting, but what was really interesting to me is that um, she, she had an assessment of what he was supposed to sound like. Similarly, Reggie Bush says this, he says, love listening to this dude, James Winston, talk after games, walks and talks like a true champion, a great role model for kids to look up to. Um, similarly, somebody named LeBron James, a French name, I guess, he says, unfreaking believable interview by, by James just shows what, shows part of the reason why he's so special. So here's the question. How could three people hear the exact same words? and derive such different responses to the exact same information. And so for me, there's a word in the English language that gives me, uh, it gives me some concern and that word is organic. Um, in the English language and contemporary colloquial terms, organic means let's leave it alone, it's untouched, right? But in science, it, it, it means carbon-based structure. So everything is fundamentally organic if it comes out of the ground, pesticides or not, but for us, it means don't touch it. So here, here's, what, here's what I wanna suggest. We teach in classrooms without challenging the, the nature of the language norms. They're left undefined. So here's what I mean. What did she expect him to sound like? As a 19-year-old African-American man from Mobile, Alabama, who played on a football team, comprised of predominantly African-American men from the southeast of the United States, he sounded like he's supposed to sound. He used the language of his culture, he sounded like a 19 year old from Mobile, Alabama, who tends to talk to other African Americans, right? So why would we expect him to sound like anything else, right? Imagine if he said, you know, Jameis, how was the game? How did you respond? He was like, it was a fascinating competition. 
Um, we were perplexed by the challenges in the game, and I, I understand the challenges, but we were able to supersede. He wouldn't even sound right. We would look at him like, what is wrong with you? But we allow the language norms of the classroom to be undefined, and by, by default, we then lean to the culture of power. So let me give you an example. If you show up to a chemistry class, the one thing I don't, I expect you not to know is chemistry. When you show up to biology class, the one thing I expect you not to know is biology. But then I ask you lots of questions about biology and chemistry, and I expect you to use, to use the new science language that no one has taught you before, right? It is illogical, and we have yet to challenge how this works. And so you think about it. We play a game of guess what's in my head, where the only person who was supposed to speak is the student. And I'm, I messed it up completely. The only person who's supposed to speak is the one student who has the right answer. So the question is, how should the language norms of the classroom be established? When you're learning science, you're learning new words and new ideas simultaneously. When you're learning Spanish, at least you're getting new words for ideas you already understand. But here's the challenge. We don't define the classroom language norms for young people. We expect them to sound like scientists. And that's the heart of the research that we've done for, for several years. So congratulations, you just read chapters two and three of our book. Uh, and what we wanna do is to kind of talk about how, how science learning shapes this challenge. Ultimately, I wanna argue that if we take no care for how language learning works, then we present a hurdle for students and we, we're pushing young people out without even thinking critically about how the role of language supports their learning. Uh, so I'm gonna to argue today that there is a language identity dilemma that stands at the heart of what we do in science. On one side is cognitive. And so you've all been there. You've been in a classroom, the teacher stands in the front of the classroom and they're communicating with new science language and you have no idea what they're talking about, right? Lots of new ideas, lots of new language, but you don't understand what they're saying. Similarly, right? On the other end, uh, when you're there, there's, I don't understand. On the other hand, students have the right answers, but they explain these ideas in a language that the teacher cannot recognize. So let me say it again. If I ask you an idea about something you learned in the culture of your own community, why would you communicate that in science language if the ideas were not expressed in science language? And so if you learned about grippiness from being a skateboarder and we're talking about friction, I wouldn't expect the young people to use the words unless I'm explicitly teaching them, but students' brilliance often goes invisible because the teachers are listening to the ideas that the students understand expressed in science language. There's a second part, an emotional or emotive response to how language is communicated. We use language to communicate feeling. So the inverse is true. Imagine if someone says inside of the nucleus is the nucleolus. Well, inside of the nucleolus is the uh, is, is where ribosomes are made and ribosomes are responsible for protein production. Well, I get frustrated with jargon. It tells me I'm not supposed to be here because people like me don't speak like this. And so the two halves of this, the cognitive challenge and the emotional challenges are where we study and I really struggle to make sure educators understand that we're missing a really powerful opportunity. So let me start. Uh, many years ago, I did a study about students' cognitive understanding of phenomena. And I asked them a simple question. How does a curveball curve? And I'm gonna explain this to you really quickly so you can hear the ideas, but you can see the red arrow. When, you, when the curveball is thrown, it's just spun as quickly as possible. And on the top of the ball, the air is going the opposite direction of the spin. But on the bottom of the ball, the air is going the exact same direction as the spin. And so what happens is as it slows, it dramatically shifts directions. Now, why is that important? Because it's the same principle that we use for uh, lifting airplanes or the reason why we have spoilers on the back of a car is if we create greater air pressure on one side, it either can lift up an object or cause it to, to go downward. The question is for these young people, how does a curveball curve? This is called the Magnus effect or air pressure differential. So I'm gonna show you a, qu a quick excerpt. And the question is, is this young person right or wrong? Uh, well, when you um, flick the ball, it cuts through the air. Um, event, it has different errors under it and over it, and either and starts pressing pressing it down, so it drops, and the air on the bottom is more loose in the right way, and it just like the heavy pressure makes it drop. All right, good people, I need your help in the chat. In the chat, tell me, is he right or is he wrong? I need your I need some thoughts. Is he right or is he wrong? Let me make sure I can see it, everybody. Uh, 
All right, we got we have a couple of people who says right. Sounds like he understands the fundamentals, right? No one's no one's willing to say he's wrong. I never heard air pressure differential. I certainly did not hear Magnus effect. How could it be? All right, I think we're we we'll see where we're headed. But here, here's here's the challenge. Would this student perform well on an assessment? Because the assessment is not just testing his conceptual understanding, which is fundamentally clear here, but it is also testing the role of his language understanding, the language that we simply don't teach in the classroom. So here's what I want though. If he's saying it has different airs under it and over it, I would love for a teacher to hear this brilliance and say, what do you mean when you say it has different airs under it and over it? Give me some more, right? And once they, they recognize that he means that the air is pushing differently, then you, you offer the science language. You say, well, you know, we call this air pressure differential. This is the conceptual continuity we're talking about, where the idea is clear, but the language is not. But what's fundamental here is our language norms, our organic language norm. Why would we expect this young person to use the science language of Magnus effect or differential air, air pressure if the culture that he learned it in, in this case, baseball, doesn't require it? So what I'm arguing today is we missed the brilliance of our young people because we simply are not attuned to how language represents people and how language and idea are not the same thing. All right, so to do this, many years ago, I worked with a teacher in Detroit and we developed a way of teaching uh, to address this. And so the idea was this, if we separate, we wanna model this after a foreign language teacher. Foreign language teachers understand, I need to understand the culture of the language to understand. They also understand I need to speak broken Spanish before I become a Spanish fluent person. I need to be able to practice it and get it wrong. Let's build an environment of practice. So we develop what is called disaggregate instruction. So the idea is use simple language first. So instead of teaching the idea and language at the same time, let's teach the simple idea first and then give students to practice using language in the context of their own lives. So they have an opportunity to use it in ways that matter to them. And so um, what does that look like? I'm going to give you a quick excerpt. If I'm teaching about osmosis, in this particular case, you're going to hear a teacher teaching about the fundamental ideas of osmosis, but they're not going to use the science language until the end. Here's what disaggregate instruction might look like. Now, we all know and love the story of Finding Nemo. Father and son get separated. Son makes new friends in a fish tank. Father goes on an epic journey to save his only child. And following the Disney way of life, everyone ends up living happily ever after. But what if there was some dark twist lurking in the shadow of the story? What if the dentist who found our tiny orange friend actually gave Nemo to his crazy niece, Darla? She doesn't know about marine life. And instead of putting Nemo into a new and friendly saltwater fish tank, she put Nemo into a freshwater fish bowl would it really matter? Salt water, fresh water, I mean, it's all water, right? Would everything end up happily ever after for our little lost clownfish Nemo? No, no way. So what gives? Why can't you put a saltwater fish into a freshwater tank? Well, fish that live in the ocean, like our little friend Nemo, are happy campers when they're surrounded by water. There's salt inside Nemo's body and outside Nemo's body. And nature likes everything to be balanced. And this is exactly what happens for saltwater fish when they're in a saltwater environment. Because again, there's salt on both sides of Nemo's skin. But when you put a fish like Nemo into fresh water, the conditions around him change. Now, unlike his happy home in the ocean, Nemo has more salt in his body than the fresh water around him. Nature hates that there's more salt on the inside than on the outside and wants to balance this out. Now, if we could look through a microscope at Nemo's body, we would see that there's tiny openings in his skin, kind of like doorways. Now, the salt molecules inside Nemo's body are way too big to fit through these tiny doorways. But, Water molecules are super small and fit perfectly through them. Only water can move easily in and out of a fish's body. Nature wants everything to even out, and the only way you can balance this is for water to start pouring into Nemo's body. Well, 
Nemo has so much salt compared to the fresh water surrounding him that the water just keeps coming in his body. With this effect, Nemo may as well have been a blowfish instead of a clownfish because he will swell up like a balloon. Eventually, he'll swell up so much that his cells will start to burst until finally he goes belly up. Poor Nemo. Doesn't really make for a very good Disney ending. This process of water flowing through these tiny doorways is called osmosis, and it's an amazing phenomenon. Don't put Nemo into a freshwater tank. He's a saltwater fish and needs to be surrounded by salt. The most important tip for our fishy friends out there, stay on osmosis's good side. So what you just saw is an exercise that my colleague, uh, Jeannie Lithgott, developed as a way to help teachers tell the story of the phenomena, but we're asking them to do it without the language so we can make sure language instruction is central. It's the second component. We're, we're disaggregating teaching concept first and teaching language second. Now I'm a researcher. So the challenge was how might I assess this? And so I'm gonna share a few experiments that we did uh, and, and share those outcomes. So one of the things we did was just to compare uh, control group. So our control group in this study of disaggregate instruction is not a teacher who just teaches without any care. I want to pay respect to teachers. They tend to, to teach language, but they do both at the same time. They teach science and everyday language, science and the idea simultaneously. So that was our control group. What if I teach the idea and the language at the same time versus our experimental group where it was idea first, language second. So both groups got a pretest. They were taught in either one of these fashions and we gave them a post-test. So here's what it looked like. We were concerned about teacher, teacher skill. And so to make sure we had um, validity across all of our measures, everything was done online. And the only thing that changed was the word. So for example, uh, the young people got this oxygen, carbon dioxide photons versus good air that we need for breathing, light, water, and air that humans breathe out. And how do we get the words? We did a pre-assessment to find out how do they talk about it. We use their language to make sure there was clarity. Um, what I want to show you is that overall, across all measures, those in the treatment group retain the information at a much greater rate. If you look at the far left, there's multiple choice overall. So when asked multiple choice, uh, the students in the, in the experimental group who are taught with the disaggregate approach, uh, their learning game was about 70% as opposed to those who are taught with science, language, and idea at the same time, about, about 58%. I want you to look all the way to the right, where it says multiple act, aggregate. This is where we ask the question using really dense language. You'll notice the differences in those two groups has reduced, meaning the learning game when you ask the question using science language is less, which suggests learning language is difficult, but for the students in our, our experimental group, they were able to retain that information at a higher rate simply because we taught it where the idea came first. When we ask them to talk about it using open-ended questions, just tell us how the stomata plays a role in photosynthesis. That is where we saw the largest gain. So when our open-ended questions, the students who were taught with simple language, their retention rates of 30% gain versus about 17% for those in the experimental group. So the, the message was simple across all measures, those who are taught with simple language retain the information at a much greater rate than those who were taught with both. Now, we were also concerned with how there was an emotive response. And so same experiment, one group got science language and ideas at the same time. The other group got simple language first, but we used two different psychological stress measures. And so um, we're gonna talk quickly about the Stroop and Flanker test. And these are, this is uh, the experimental condition. Both groups got the exact same video and explained the idea of the water cycle. The experimental group got this. Evaporation happens when water changes its shape, even though it is still water, the temperature forces water pieces to move more rapidly. That is it. The idea is explained with very simple language versus the control group. When water evaporates, it expands its bond length and changes to gaseous form as the temperature of the water increases, causing random rapid kinetic motion. Now, here's the thing. Exact same number of words, exact same idea. The only difference was the language that we chose to use. And so we then gave them um, a Stroop or a Flanker test. So you watched the video, you learned about the idea, and then you took one of these tests. And so you've seen these before probably. A Stroop test is when the word yellow was written in yellow, you have to push the Y button. So here's the question. You have to push the button that matches the co color that it is written in. And so if they are the same, that's an that's congruent measure. But sometimes where yellow will be written in red, so you have to ignore what it says and click the R button because you're focused on the actual color of the word itself. That is a Stroop test. Similarly, the flanker test, you're looking for the centermost arrow. And so all you need to do is push the arrow 
of the on your on your keyboard that matches the direction of the centermost arrow. Congruent, meaning all the arrows are pointed the same way, versus incongruent, which means this: I have to ignore the distractors, identify the arrow, and point that way. So here's what we found: across all measures, those taught with simple language were faster in their capacity to understand and recognize those patterns. So take a look. The treatment group, the average reaction time of 1300 milliseconds versus the control group for the incongruent. Now this is what this means. Red is written in blue, so I have to ignore that word red and hit the B button. Well, we had statistically significant results and a pretty strong effect size of 0.7, which means this, giving students simple language free cognitive capacity. Now these are known as stress measures, but they, not, they don't necessarily indicate stress. They indicate how distracted you are, right? And so if you look at the congruent, this means the colors are matching. 1185 milliseconds versus 1200 milliseconds, uh, it, it was more powerful when you had to do additional work. Similarly, on the flanker test, exact same phenomenon. Students who are taught with simple language, 600 milliseconds versus 1000 milliseconds, right? Very strong effect size here. And so this means the students were better able to identify this. Now, to make sense of it, I, I like to think of it this way. It is akin to parallel parking. If you have your music up loud, you're listening to something, you're feeling good, and you're parallel parking, sometimes you turn the music down so you can focus. The argument for us is that what is very powerful here is that the language we use is causing students the additional stress so that it requires additional focus. So if they learn better through simple language, if it is causing them greater cognitive difficulty, then why do we make affordances? Why don't we make affordances for how students learn? Right. And so we did find some mediating effects and I don't want to get too far into it, but the number one mediating effect was age. And so I'll show you the older you are, the faster you are with making this assessment, the faster you were to recognize and deal with the complex nature of language, which suggests we just get used to it. Right. And that's fundamentally problematic. It is not a finding I was happy to find, but older students are better able to deal with the complex nature of language as a distractor. But the question is, why would we do that to our young people? When I ask people, when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I tell them, I try to convince teachers to use language that students know so that they can understand the ideas better. And they tell me like, bro, that is the dumbest research of all time. I sort of agree. But the idea is simple language provides access to understanding and we need to teach students to use that language. Let's go back to these phone numbers, right? How do we remember those phone numbers in the first place? I want to argue that the number that you remember is a sibling or a parent that, oh, I'm in trouble, I need to call this number. That is the one number that you remember. And I wanna argue that you remember that number because of the necessity of it, right? So if our computers on our shoulders are gonna delete all unnecessary information and language learning is a burden, I wanna argue that number one, we need to teach science in a context that students cannot forget because it is a powerful tool and explanatory pieces in their life. Number two, we need to make sure that language is not a hurdle and start with simple language and give them practice using new science language. So let me give an example of how this might happen. Currently, our lab group is engaged in, in work on virtual reality. And, and you might ask, why is this important? When I first encountered virtual reality, there was a problem for me. Here was the problem. We were taking students to um, exotic locations. We're taking them to the moon, to the pyramids of Giza, and that's phenomenal. But I literally wanted them to see the science that is happening in their neighborhood. Because if I could teach them the science that is happening in their local context, every time they go into that context, how could you possibly forget? It's like dialing that important number. I wanna make our young people experts in understanding the science in their own neighborhood so that they can be the person who explains to their families. And I'm gonna give you a quick example before we move forward. So here's an example. where we take students in the local liquor store. And, and what they're asked to do is to look for primary producers, meaning fresh fruits and vegetables, and analyze the kind of food that they have available. This is Dr. Prima Ruhar, who worked this project with us. And the idea is if I teach you about fruits and vegetables, if I teach you about food facts, and then I take you into your local context and have you analyze how diabetes is linked to access to healthy food, then what happens is that the young people are more inclined to be able to apply these ideas to their lives. It's punching in that phone number. I'm enabling young people to see the science in their neighborhood. So for the past few years, we've, we've been working to not only develop these things and to explore them. First, you'll notice that Kendrick Lamar is playing with, with, with purpose. Uh, for some reason, science videos are, are voiced over by British 
British voice actors, there's classical music playing, and we have to ask ourselves, when we communicate science ideas, why are we not rooting it in the culture that the students live in? And so we wanted to make sure they're sending subtle messages to students that you belong. And so I'm gonna share quickly, uh, one study with 48 students where we did pre and post interviews of how science was impacted, how their learning was impacted by learning through culturally relevant virtual reality. Uh, and, and what we found is that in general, when we compared the students in our study to those, it, we did three trials, to those across the state of California, uh, they were better able to learn in two of the three trials than other students from that similar demographic. So although we weren't better than everyone in the state, our study was, was comprised of uh, low-income African-American and Hispanic students. They were performing at higher rates than their counterparts across the state in two out of our three trials. Uh, more importantly, when we did our survey, we asked them, how do you connect to science? How does the science that you're learning in the local cultural context have meaning for you? We found a couple of things. Number one, we saw a shift in these very short interventions and in students' attitudes about science, meaning they saw it as deeper connected to themselves. Number two, NGSS practices, when they thought about how the practices of instruction mattered and how they can reason like a scientist, there was greater growth there. And finally, they started to see science as a part of their community. And I'm gonna share this quickly before we before I move to a close, is that there were three domains that really emerged and we're talking about fifth graders. Fifth graders began to talk about health justice. And so when we asked them, well, tell us about your experience. They said things like, well, this lesson was connected to my community because there's a lot of people in my community that eat unhealthily and I kind of want to help them to be a healthier eater. We were able to move the science content from an abstraction to something that helps them see themselves as connected to the community. They talked about economic justice, right? Students said, well, there's advantages for stores where, where there's money or the government has money. So students start to think, well, even though we never talked about finances, that the, the that finances are driving people's access to healthy food. Now, again, going back to our premise, I really want to make sure that they can see how science is happening in the local context so that they cannot forget it becomes meaningful, it becomes powerful. And finally, they talked about environmental justice. Well, if people keep buying plastic and food and junk, they could throw it away in the sea and damage birds. So they're even starting to think about how there's environmental limitations to having access to the type of food that they should in their local context. And so the question for us is what do we do? And so I'm gonna make a simple argument before, before we shut it down today is that we teach in the way we train instructors is to teach in context, right? Using uh, the same process that we use at Michigan State, which is a cognitive apprenticeship lesson planning. The idea here is we always start instruction with a problem. Right, and so we then model, meaning the first stages of instruction, we want our young people to be introduced to the idea where the teacher plays a role, but it is okay to get it wrong. I wanna say that again, it is okay to get it wrong. We build environments where we don't expect the young people to start with the right answer. And in fact, the wrong answer is the perfect place to be. We shift to coaching where we want our young people to be able to articulate, to speak broken science, to articulate their ideas, to iterate towards expertise and finding lots of fading activities. So the question is, what might that look like? So I would never teach osmosis. What I would teach is, um, should we marinate our chicken? Because um, why, right? Does marinating meat work? So I'm thinking about carne asada. If I'm teach, thinking about uh, jerk chicken, um, why would we waste our time? on marinade. Well, to me, marinade is the story of osmosis and diffusion because it's the seasoning is getting into the food. There's only one explanation is random kinetic motion of uh, us causing the seasoning and the water to move in and out. The reason why we teach it in that context, because I want them to be local experts. I want them to explain to grandparents, to cousins, here's, here's why this is important. And more importantly, they will see it over and over and over again. That is important information. So we might start with the problem. The central question is, why do we marinate carne asada? Why do we marinate chicken? And then we start to, to build modeling-based instruction. What are the big ideas? We start to, maybe a short lecture, short reading. Let's build out our basic understanding in an environment where the wrong answer is value. And then let's shift the coaching. Let's do an experiment because don't take my word for it. I need all the young people to really have a chance to explore at depth. Right? We have them do some animations, some drawings, some modeling, so they get an opportunity to be experts. And then we build our authentic opportunities for them to explain what they learned, maybe a, a recipe guy preparing their own instructional videos about marinade, but teaching the concepts of osmosis in the context of the lives they live. Now, one of the things I wanna to argue today is that we may have a, a challenge in filling the pipeline of teachers, right? We, bl finding black and brown science teachers is a difficult thing, but the technology we use to teach can be diverse today. I wanna to argue that digital diversity, making sure the ideas 
that students are experienced, a reflection of their culture. It can happen today. You can have your young people build those models. For my teachers out there, I want you to change your essential questions. So it cannot be about you. So I want you to move from ideas about how do humans affect climate change to empowering young people to explain how issues of climate change are connected to their local issues. So how are heat islands creating negative health for people from low SES? Let's build a community of young people where their expertise is valued and what they're learning is explaining what they're experiencing. So we wanna use social issues to create the need for learning. Students will acquire information if you allow them to be experts. Secondly, alter your formative assessment. Uh, we are right now writing the paper suggesting that if you embed lots of opportunities for formative assessment for students to explain, that they will develop a mastery. I want you to think about it. How often have you been in a classroom environment where the time that you realized you didn't know was at the test? It is the, it is the process of explaining that revealed to you that I did not understand or I understood this part, but not that part. We're arguing, I need those experiences. I just need them throughout the lesson, create lots of opportunities for young people to talk about ideas that matter. Right? Give them practice explaining the concept, but in social context. Um, there's a new technology. Our teachers did something really phenomenal, is in these hybrid learning environments, the difficulty of COVID, they, teachers got better. They learned to create, instead of one student talking, if you ask people to share in a chat or using Pear Deck, you got 30 answers at the same time. We need to lean on what we learned about hybrid education and use our digital tools to create opportunities for students to master the discourse of science, right? I'm gonna argue finally, we need to shift and I don't want teachers to be the audience for a summative assessments. Uh, maybe sometimes we want the teachers to be the person who, who we explain to, but let's make sure students have vlogs or videos where they can explain the ideas and we can share those ideas with family, with community, with school boards, is when you give students the capacity to understand a meaningful science context, take it to the places that matter, you'll get a better product, right? Have students write to city council members uh, to talk about issues of climate change, impact on housing policies and heat islands. We need to shift our paradigm of assessment at, from internal to external. Uh, building authentic learning tasks with authentic explanations will improve science education broadly. Uh, lastly, our work in our lab group in Science in the City is we're trying to think about smartphones as opposed to being walls, they are devices that open windows. They are uh, augmented reality devices. They're virtual reality devices. We need to use technology as a tool and as a bridge because one thing I learned, whether it's Metro PCS, AT&T, people are not throwing away cell phones. They give them to their kids and we have these devices in classrooms, but we are not using them to leverage the brilliance of our young people. So with that said, I just wanna thank you all for providing me an opportunity to share this work today. Uh, I want this to be the first of many conversations and we can talk on Twitter or, or you see me in the hallways, hopefully when we get back together. I'd love to talk to you about science education and how we're heading forward. And again, I wanna say thank you to the members of the Science in the City Lab for all the work you're doing. It is much appreciated. So thank you very much. All right, we're gonna get started with the Q&A. We already have a number of questions coming in. A lot of them are very practice focused. So I'm gonna circle back to that, but I wanna begin kind of where you ended. You started talking about technology and you just started with technology and then came back. I saw that move. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit about um, the, the increasing hybridity and how that's impacted science teaching and learning specifically. Um, you were talking about the pandemic, you touched on a little bit, but I'm hoping you can elaborate a little bit more about maybe what some of the challenges are, especially for our economically marginalized students and some of the opportunities that you see. Absolutely. So part of what we learned through our, uh, our virtual reality studies is that the presence of smartphones was rampant. So, 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 and I mean, I, I need a better word because that, that has negative connotations. I, I was shocked to find out that every fourth grader had a smartphone. And then we asked them why. It was like, my mom gave it to me for safety purposes. But here's what, here's what they also said. Don't use my minutes, right? So here's what that meant. The wireless, the wireless at the school was the only limiting factor. So we had students connecting to Nearpod. So I want you to imagine I can have students at the same time sharing their thoughts. I can have anonymous, all 30 kids, tell me what you think. And it's anonymous. So now I've created a completely different linguistic environment. And so there's no consequence to having the wrong answer. In fact, I can have the ideas up, share the ideas as a teacher and say, all right, somebody has this idea wrong. Let's talk about it. Each, everybody teach each other. So I can create discussions where we move from one expert to 35 experts at the same time. 
the, the smartphones enable us to do that. You can do it with iPads, you can do it with, with tablets, but here's the challenge. We have a negative attitude and a false understanding of the role of technology. So people are talking about the digital divide as if there are not laptops and computers. So a couple of things emerged. I, I don't say positive things about Silicon Valley all the time, but they put laptops in every school in, in Silicon Valley immediately, the, the, the minute that it happened, right? Those laptops have not disappeared, but are we using their capabilities? So for example, those phones, if you have a phone that's less than five years old, it can use aug augmented reality, right? Where's the augmented reality resources for our young people, right? Who makes them? We're virtual reality. We're, so the, the point is, we, if we can use them to support what we know about learning, that is moving students from passive recipients to active explainers, active analyzers, their, their clickers, their, their tablets, their simulators, their microscopes. We got to use them and we got to use them today. Thank you for that. You have a lot to work with. I'm, I'm curious about um, the student populations. For example, in California, we know we have a huge population of students designated as English learners. So you talk about urban populations and I'm wondering, uh, I feel like the language of science presents kind of a unique challenge to folks who don't primarily speak English. I wonder if your book speaks to that at all or if there are resources that you might point people to to help kind of bridge that gap. Absolutely. So I think that's that is something that is um, at the forefront of education broadly. Now, I, I want to start by saying there's a misnomer. And I think that at the heart of the problem for me is that we have to accept we have a monolingual teaching force teaching a multilingual and multicultural student population. Now, what does that mean? That means Spanish, but it means Spanish is. It means Mexican American Spanish. It means Mexican Spanish. It means people from Guatemala. And so the question is, in the classroom I worked in, I had students who were coming from Vietnam, so I, I, I had uh, students from multiple linguistic backgrounds. So what do you do, right? All the research would suggest that you have to teach ideas and language. And so enabling students to tap into their cognitive resources, which they have multiple language resources and engaging in translanguaging is at the core of what we want them to do. Being able to go back and forth between science language uh, and Spanish and English in order to develop the mastery. But here's a, the heart of the problem. We don't make an affordance for students to explain. So if you're not explaining in English, if you're not explaining in Spanish, how are you gonna develop mastery anyway? And so Trish Stoddard, who's at UC Santa Cruz, did a lot of work um, suggesting that we, you know, students have to learn Spanish anyway. So, I mean, English, so let's make sure they're translating from Spanish to English, right? Students, we have to shift our paradigm. The teacher as the only explainer undermines that practice. Now, anybody who's ever taught as a monolingual teacher like I did knows the only way it works is if your students work as instructors, your multilingual students. Because what I'm finding is I rarely have students who are not multilingual. I have lots of versions of Spanish mastery and English mastery in those classrooms. And so we have to work in group context, build complex instruction models, and students will do quite well. And I'm glad that you explicitly called out that we have a, a predominantly monocultural, monolingual teaching for us. And that means that there's kind of, there's a gap, a gap in knowledge about what culturally relevant science could really look like. So we have a few questions in the chat uh, that have come up about how one would go about finding culturally relevant science videos. You know, when we talk about reducing things to simple language, how do we do that in a way that honors our students' complexity um, yeah. and that doesn't kind of flatten or essentialize our students? And also when you talk about like necessity of information for the students, how might people who are a little bit less tapped into those communities get that knowledge? Great question. So one of the hardest parts of doing this work is you have to accept that your science knowledge is insufficient. Um, meaning this, so if I learned about hydrogen bonding, I have to ask, well, how does hydrogen bonding apply to the culture of my students? And that is the work that I'm asking every teacher to do. You have to engage in pre-assessments. So I'm gonna give you a quick example. For me, when I find out, found out that um, the reason why humidity changes the hair of people who curl their hair or straighten their hair is because hu humidity, because of the polar ends, positive and negative, just like a magnet of, uh, of water, and if you curl your hair when it is straight or straighten your hair when it is curled, the reason why you do that is you've broken the bonds, the water will snap those bonds back into place. Now, now I got something, right? I know lots of people who that's pertinent information for. So I had to do the work of looking for that connection. So what I'm asking teachers to do is to understand that the nature of learning requires us to rethink the content in the context of students' lives. And that's hard work. Now, how do I build the materials? Um, I've been suggesting for years, 
that what we do is, is as a fundamental assessment, let's have students explain how the science is, is happening in their life, right? So explain the concept because those videos, if I have small groups of six um, and one of them is phenomenal, now I have a teaching resource for the year moving forward. So students are much better at using technology. Let's, let's let them be creative when building TikToks and Instagram pages to, um, to talk about science phenomena and those become the culturally relevant resources that we use. And we have like a specific question about someone asking if there's anyone currently making culturally relevant science videos or any channels you recommend or just resources that we can share out or you can point people toward. Um, obviously there's a rap genius, Christopher Emden, who's now at USC has spent many years uh, building those out. Um, science with Tom, which is a YouTube venue. Uh, I had the privilege of working with PBS and PBS with the uh, What's Good series is a, is a whole science series designed for cultural relevancy as well as the um, Ruff Ruffman show, which is a show designed to represent cultural diversity and it is um, linguistically and culturally diverse using culturally relevant practices. And so there are materials out there. Now there's not a coherent curriculum and so I don't wanna oversell it, but I do wanna make, make the uh, point that people are building these, these uh, resources, but as a teacher, no resource is uniformly culturally relevant in the same way that no resource is fundamentally culturally irrelevant. What you have to do is customize for your young people. And my first suggestion is have your students start to build out materials for themselves. Fantastic. I, I want to get to this question because I think a lot of people grapple with it. So uh, this person asks, I was wondering if you could speak about the implications for teaching science. Is it necessary to teach students to learn and master science discourse? If so, do you have any suggestions on how science educators can support students to move from using everyday language to talk about science to using science discourse to talk about science? Absolutely. So, so part of what I, I understand and understood early on is that there's a reason for the science language. It's not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that science language is the problem. I'm suggesting that our inability to teach it is the problem. The reason for science language is it enables you to communicate with scientists, particularly in written form, in efficient ways. Scientists themselves don't walk around using gibberish to communicate. They actually can communicate in everyday language. So the issue is that we need to prepare students to be able to communicate and read and, and participate in the science community where the ideas are taught explicitly. So to the, get to the question, what I am suggesting is that we need to make sure that we give students opportunities to use the language. And so all we need to do is borrow from what we learn from our language instructors. If I want to learn Spanish, if I want to learn French, you would tell me, move to France and speak with the French. If I want to learn Spanish, you would say, move to Mexico and go to Mexico City and have conversations. So why not engage in scientific conversations using science language? We can do that with other classrooms. We can do that with scientists, but the process is, What's vital is we've got to make sure students are centered and their voices are, are centered so they have an opportunity to master the science language. That's really where we're limited right now as a field. We often allow the students to sit passively while the teacher's doing all the talking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and thinking about the field, we had uh, someone, Nancy Wright popped in the chat and she said that uh, in the education department, our practices have begun to change, but what about in the science departments in the university? But they're struggling to, on getting university professors to lean into this work while yeah. most teachers are thrilled. I do a lot of talks with scientists. And uh, the first thing that they suggest to me is that, are you suggesting that I dumb down the science? Right? As if learning um, the science was dumbing it down. So the suggestion is that if I just use the science language, then only the smart people are capable of understanding, which gives me an out. It suggests that my horrific instruction, right, filters out those who are talented and those who are not. So the suggestion for me is that if we really want people to learn, why wouldn't we want everybody to learn? So it goes back to the, I, I kind of joked that the simple nature of my research, if I'm communicating to you and I select a dialect that I know you don't understand, I am fundamentally a, assuming that I have no desire for you to learn it. And so science has a different assumption that we don't hear from English teachers. Well, if you don't, if you're not able to write this five, five paragraph par structure, you're just not smart. And we have enabled that culture to hide how we value poor instruction. And at the same time, we then are skirting the responsibility because we're also charged with this. We're charged with creating the next generation of scientific thinking 
uh, participants, whether that means you're a scientist, whether that means you're contributing in discussions about whether or not to vaccinate. And if we've seen it now more than we've ever seen it before, having people informed and being able to make structured scientific arguments is super valuable. So I say that to say science has to change its paradigm, par paradigmatic assumptions about why people don't understand. And that is where I find there is absolute opposition because we have an identity issue with scientists, right? We're the academically elite. Therefore, if you don't get it, you're just not as smart as me. It's just not true. I love that. And I think that's a pretty good ending note. I know that we want to, uh, first of all, thank you so much <laughs> for an amazing presentation. People were highly engaged. We really encourage y'all. Uh, the, the talk will be posted. I saw a lot of people asking for the slides. The talk will be posted on our website, which is in the chat. Um, if you're trying to get on our email, our email list, uh, Kendra is going to put our email in the chat so that you can hit us up and we'll make sure that you're, you'll have access to all of our talks going forward. We have one next week with Dr. Ann Charity Hudley. She'll be talking about her book. We're very, very excited. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Coco. Don't miss it. Dr. Ann Charity Hudley. She is a force. You're in for a great one next week. <laughs>